verse 10 to 23. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew or wine, olive oil or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now, give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of twenty measures, there were only ten. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were only twenty. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the wine, the vine, sorry, and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the, the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Thank you, Um As I said earlier, my name is Tom. I'm part of the um, Allerton Connect Group, one of the elders here, and also exceptionally tall, so I'll just make sure this is a time. Um, if, like me, you read that passage the first time just now and thought, what on earth is that about? We're going to need God's help. Um, you're not alone, so let's ask his help together as we, we look at that together. Um, every time in this passage, and your word teaches us that we are weak, um, that we are liable to get things wrong. Um, but you are great and glorious. And so I pray that in my words, in our thoughts and our responses, you will be glorified as we study your word together today. Amen. 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 Just worth saying as we start as well, if um, English isn't your first language and you'd like a copy of what I'm about to say in Persian, there's some over on the table or I'm sure you can shut your hand up, so I'm going to bring you one. And also, if you'd like a copy in English, they're available on on the website at crashchurchliverpool.org forward slash transcript, so feel free to have a look. I, uh, I came across a website the other week, it's one of those websites that serves absolutely no practical purpose but uh, to make you smile, and it shows pictures of people's baking catastrophes, um, but it shows them alongside an image of what they were trying to make, what the recipe shows, so I thought I'd share a few with you, this works which is not so last one I'd have to move on. Um, there we are. First one, a hedgehog cake. That's what they're trying to make. That's what the recipe shows. Um, what's that going to end up like? Let's have a little look. Oh, I think they are very good. There's a cup. <laughs> what you're doing with that mouth there, I have absolutely no idea. Um, what about another one? The Thomas the Tank Engine, this is one that we've, uh, I think we tried to recreate in our family. Um, it's a tricky one, what could go wrong there? <laughs> um, this one, I think we're on more solid ground. If it goes on. Oh, 
they were all completely correct. Oh, there we are. And what's on the ground? At least it's a cube, huh? So you must be able to make a square, surely. Well, let's see what that one turns out like if you can. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> I'm going to be laughing at them, but I kind of do feel for these bakers. I, I know the pressure it is to try and make a, a birthday cake to demand. Um, and they're diligently following the recipe. They're trying to do all the right things, but it looks like what a dog's dinner, doesn't it? What's gone wrong? They work hard. They do all the right things, they wear all the ingredients, they follow the instructions to the letter. So why is it not easier to make a decent birthday cake? I wonder if you felt like that in life or in church. You're trying to do the right things, so why is it so hard? I, I know from experience, I felt this as a kids leader in our church. You pray, you plan studies to teach our children the gospel. So why does it actually have to be so hard for me in a kid session? Why won't they listen? Why won't they join in? Why aren't they appreciative? Why do they always get distracted and talk over you? I, I, I have to confess, I feel like they sometimes welcome me. I want to welcome people into my life and into my family. I want to love people and bring you to our church, but it, it's hard to plan and prepare a meal, not knowing who's coming or how many are coming or what they will and what they won't eat. It's stressful catering for a crowd when you don't know numbers and dietary requirements, and yet to still try and be welcoming and engaging. It's a good thing to do, but it's hard. So I actually think any of us in church life probably feels like this. You work hard to set up, to welcome, to make tea, to practice music, to teach, to invite. In fact, for a lot of people, just coming to church itself is hard. In a room that's as sort of crowded as this one, you can feel both kind of claustrophobic but also alone at the same time. And you want to get to know and love people, but it's overwhelming. You don't know where to start or what to say. Why isn't it easier when we're all trying to do the right thing? Well, I suspect the people we just read about, the people in Haggai, I think they probably felt a bit like this. You see, over the last few weeks, when we've been reading this book, we've seen that there are repentant and responsive people. It looks like they really are trying to do the right thing. They're people, just to catch up on their history, they returned from exile, so they've seen Jerusalem, God's holy city, kind of besieged. They've seen the temple destroyed, and they've been forcibly sort of removed from the land, the land that God had promised their ancestors live in Babylon. But that, that was all 70 years before Haggai's time. And now that the Persian Empire, they've overthrown the Babylonian Empire, and the Persian kings, they're more sympathetic to Jerusalem. They've allowed people to return to build the temple. And, and they're the people that Haggai's talking to. They've returned to Jerusalem. They've responded to God's challenge to consider their priorities, and they've started work building the temple. They persevered with that work, even though it's an architectural disappointment. They're encouraged by God's presence and his promise to be glorified through their work and to make this temple more glorious than its predecessor. They've done everything they've asked of them, it seems. They've returned, responded, rebuilt, but life isn't any easier. We know that their building project, it was, well, it faced fierce opposition from their neighbours. It looks like they were living in a time of famine. There was insufficient food and wine. Their work was hampered by blight and hail and mildew. And they were living in occupation. Yes, they returned home. But they were still ruled by Darius, and he's the king of Persia. They're at the mercy of his whims and his decrees. And all these opposition, occupation, famine, blight, mildew, they're signs throughout Israel's history of God's displeasure at his people's disobedience. So why isn't life any easier than these people? They are trying to do the right things. Well, Haggai's initial answer in this passage, it will feel like a punch to the gut for Because he tells people who are seemingly working hard to do all the right things that they are part of the problem. He tells the people that they are defiled. He does this by quitting the priest. He tests their knowledge of the Old Testament rules for cleanliness, for holiness. Can you look up the next one? That's right. Now, we are probably not all experts on the, the Old Testament rules of holiness, but the priest should be. It was their job to mediate between men and God. 
to maintain the holiness of the sanctuary, the temple, and from there to maintain the holiness of the people. So I think of it like, like this. Next picture, if you can. Think of it like a, a bowl of fruit. We have a fruit bowl in our home, uh, and every once in a while I'll make a fruit bowl, and I'll notice that something in the bottom has gone a bit mouldy. It's often a lime or a satsuma or something like that. And so I'll have to, to fish it out. But when I do that, I'll notice it's been touching another fruit, and that the, the mould has spread to that one, and to another, and to another, and to another. And so in the end, I'll end up having to throw away five fruits, all because one of them got mouldy. What I can't do in that situation, I can't put in a, a fresh satsuma and expect its goodness to sort of transfer to the bad ones. Defilement is contagious. Badness always spreads to affect the good. Goodness does not spread the other way, to cleanse the bad. And that's the point that Haggai is making, God's making when Haggai quizzes the priests. Just look at their words. If someone carries consecrated meat, that's meat that's been set aside for some holy purpose or sacrifice or something. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, no. No, goodness doesn't travel from the good to the bad. Holiness doesn't travel from the holy to the ordinary. Then Haggai said, if a person is defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Badness always travels from the bad to the good. Defilement is contagious. And so the priests, they can pass the test, which is good for them. But it's not much consolation, because here comes Haggai's sucker punch. So it is with his people. And this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer is defiled. Ouch. He's effectively saying each of you is like a moldy fruit in a bowl that contaminates everything you come in contact with. That's hard news, it's devastating news, particularly for people without a temple. Because the temple, that was the place of sacrifice, the place of forgiveness, the place of dealing with sin and with defilement. But Haggai's generation didn't have a temple. And the one they're building, it looks like it's going to be defiled, because they're building it and they are defiled. Yes, we're called to be strong and to work for God. We saw that last week, but our work, whatever it is, it can never be a sort of transaction to win God's favour or blessing. We can never achieve that. Even all our best efforts will be defiled, will be marred by sin. So our work can only ever be a response to God, an act of worship, responding to his presence with us and his promise to be blessed, to be glorified through us. So it should be no surprise that life isn't easy even when we try to do the right thing. Because we're defiled, and the people around us are defiled as well. We will all struggle with sin, and suffering, and doubt. We will let each other down, even in this church. Life and church will be hard. Relationships will be strained. Children will be mischievous. Budgets will be tight. Building projects will be disappointing. And opposition to the gospel will be rough. But when life is hard, don't give up and give in in despair. And don't just try harder to be better yourself. Whatever you do, whatever you offer, won't make the grave. Now, Haggai points us to a better way to cope with hardship. He calls us out of either sort of self pity or self reliance and invites us instead to return to God, who blesses. See, Haggai's got more that he wants the priest to consider. He wants them to consider life as it actually is, like under the sun, as we said in Ecclesiastes. Look at his words. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of twenty measures, there were only ten. When anyone went to a wine vats to draw fifty measures, there were only twenty. I struck the work of your hands with blight and mildew and hail. That sounds pretty miserable, doesn't it? 
blight, mildew, hail, famine, insufficient food and wine. I said earlier, these, along with opposition and occupation, they're signs of God's displeasure. That's what Israel's history teaches us. And they're, they're signs, in fact, that Haggai has already pointed to back in chapter 1. Back there in chapter 1, verse 9, he said, You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What's going on, this? Um, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why do you fear the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. That was his reason back in chapter 1, but things have changed since chapter 1. The people have listened, they have obeyed, they fear the Lord, and they've started working on the temple. So why, nearly four months into this temple project, are things still so hard? Is there any seed left in the barn, he says in verse 19? Until now the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive oil tree have not gone through. Why is there still famine? Despite their obedience, why has there been no change in their circumstances? Well, this time, God gives a different diagnosis. It's not simply that they haven't started building the temple, because they have. Just look again at verse 17. I struck the work of your hands with blight and mildew and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Think of those words, you did not return to me. I wonder how those words sat with the people of Haggai's day, the people who had come out of exile and come home to rebuild the temple, to rebuild Jerusalem. Returning, it was their kind of defining feature. And yet, Haggai seems to be saying that their physical return, it wasn't matched by a spiritual return. Yes, they returned to Jerusalem, Yes, they were rebuilding the temple, but they possibly hadn't actually returned to the Lord wholeheartedly. I don't know what their motives were. National pride, nostalgia, political statement maybe, but it seemed that their actions for God were not matched by a devotion to him. They returned physically, but not spiritually. And there's a risk, of course, that we might do the same. I ask myself, am I more devoted to the things I do for God than I am devoted to Him? Do I put more emphasis on the work I do for God than I do my relationship with Him? You can do the right things for God, but still be far from Him. If, as you consider this, if you're convicted of the same way that may be your case, then return to God, not just with what you do, but with your whole heart. You see, Haggai's call, it's been depressing what I've said so far, isn't it? It's not to convict us or condemn us, though, but it's to encourage us to consider our ways and return to the God who blesses us, defiled as we are. And I think this is one of the reasons that life isn't easy. Yes, life's hard because we're defiled and we keep getting things wrong, but there's also a, a mercy in hardship. A hard life keeps us returning to God. And doing God's work will always be hard. It means working alongside a bunch of people who will keep messing up. But this is God's way of making sure we don't just pretend to return to Him, but that we really do it. So make it a habit to keep returning to God, because in Him there is a blessing that changes everything. Did you notice this Mary read it that there's a Haggai really wants the people to, to notice and mark the date, the 24th day of the ninth month of the second year of Darius. He tells them to give careful thought to it, to consider how these things were before, and to give thought again. What is it about this date, the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, that needs such careful thought? Haggai presented to this people struggling in hardship as a day that will change their circumstances, a day that will change history. From this day on, says the Lord, I will bless you. What hope in the face of such hardness? What encouragement to keep working even though the work is not easy? What incentive to keep returning to the Lord? 
He will bless you. But exactly what Haggai, the blessing looked like in Haggai's day is something of a mystery. You don't really see what happens because Haggai usually switches focus to another day, a future day, when God will once again change history. He invites us to look at God's chosen one who will shape the nations. Let's read from verse 20. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. We, we've heard of the shaking before. Two months earlier in verse 6, God had told them that he would shake the heavens and the earth. Back then, as Chris spoke to us last week, it seems like an economic shaking, like shaking the riches out of the nations to pour into and glorify the temple. I guess a bit like we might shake coins out of a money box or something. But now this seems to be, it's a political shake-up. We might say when a new manager arrives on our team, or oh, they're going to shake things up. Or when a new head teacher comes to a school, well, I hope they shake things up. Or when a new boss joins a company, they're going to shake things up. They'll reorganize power structures. They'll redistribute, redistribute roles and responsibilities. But what Haggai is envisioning here is a, a shake-up on a cosmic scale. I will overthrow thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. So just as the, the blessing of verse 19 seems to anticipate the end of austerity of Haggai's time, the shaking of verse 21 seems to anticipate the end of oppression and opposition. Not just Persia, but all nations, all empires, and all their military might will be overthrown. And the world will be brought under new management. God's perfect management. Isn't that what our world still desperately needs? You only have to watch the news to think. And God has chosen his tool to bring about this cosmic shape-up. His final word from Haggai is not directed to the priests or the people, but, but to one man, God's servant, Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shabbat, declares the Lord, and I will make you my signet, like my signet ring, for I have chosen you Bless the Lord Almighty. Just a clarity here, a signet ring is not just a fashion choice, it's a sign of authority. So anyone that's wearing it or decrees us or sign and stamp with it, show that they come with the authority of the king. And I will make you mine, God says to Zerubbabel. I think Zerubbabel, of all people, had reason to feel the hardship of Haggai's day. He's presented this throughout the book as the governor of Judah, and that's what he was. But he may have felt that he should have been much more in an alternate timeline. If his ancestors had obeyed the Lord, Zerubbabel would have been the king. He is the heir to the throne in Jerusalem. But there is no throne in Jerusalem. The thrones in Persia and Darius are sitting on it, and it doesn't look like he's moving. But in Zerubbabel, we don't see a man in this book who's ruining what might have been or lamenting his lowly position compared to his birthright. And we see a man who is responsive to God. He listens to Haggai's message. He fears the Lord. He obeys. And under his leadership, the people repent. They start and they persevere in the work God's given them to do, even when it's hard. What a man to look to. God's signet ring, God's chosen one. What a man to imitate when times are hard and we feel our own weaknesses. A man we can trust to lead us back to God and strengthen us for the work God's given us. And God, it seems, appreciates his efforts, defiled as they are, and he declares he will make them instrumental in his glorious purposes, in his cosmic shake-up. And so the book of Haggai, it, it ends on a cliffhanger. What will change after this day of blessing? The 24th day of the ninth month, the second year of Darius. 
And when will God use their apple to shake his heavens and the earth? As his signal. Well, the funny thing is, the other books in the Bible that are written around this time suggest the answers are nothing and never. Nothing changes. As the other book, he seems to sort of fade into obscurity. We certainly don't celebrate the 24th day of the ninth month as a day of God's blessing, do we? We don't remember the laying of the foundation of Haggai's temple. And there's nothing to suggest that the rabbi had any great military victories. So what became of these promises? But to answer that, we need to pass forward 500 years. By then, the temple had been completed. And it was glorious. In fact, it was so glorious that Jesus disciples pointed out the impressive stones and architecture. But Jesus was less than impressed. Destroy this temple, he said, and I will raise it again in three days. But John, who was one of Jesus' disciples who recorded this conversation, he adds a little note there and says, the temple Jesus had spoken of was his body. You see, Haggai's temple, all the work they're doing, it was only ever a foreshadow of the greater temple to come. Jesus himself. But more than that, Jesus isn't just a fulfillment of what was foreshadowed in the temple Haggai's generation were building. He's also heir to the promise God made to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is the great, 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 great grandfather of Joseph, husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So all that God is saying through Haggai is, is anticipating Jesus and fulfilled in him. So what do we see in Jesus? We see the King of Heaven, here on earth, in Jerusalem, without a throne, calling people to repentance and faith, leading them back to God. What do we see in Jesus? We see a man who isn't defiled by those around him, but who instead cleanses them. He transfers his goodness to them. He touched the leper and wasn't infected, but he says, be clean, and the leper is cleansed. And what he does physically, he can do spiritually as well. He forgives sins and they are forgiven, they no longer defile us. What do we see in Jesus? We see a man who blesses abundantly. In him there's none of the austerity of Haggai's day. When he gets drinks at a wedding, it's the best wine that is just tasted. When he gives fishing tips, the catch nearly sinks the boat. When he caters for a picnic, everyone has their fill, and there's more food at the end than they started with. And Jesus' cleansing and blessing are both most perfectly seen in his death and resurrection. On the cross, Jesus took our defilement on himself and gave us in return his cleanness, his righteousness, his holiness, if we believe in him. In their letters, because of this clean cleansing and blessing work that Jesus did on the cross, both Paul and Peter referred to him as the cornerstone in the foundation of God's new temple, the church. And we celebrate the laying of that foundation every year, every day. Jesus' death and resurrection have shaken the heavens and the earth. They've dominated and defined the last 2,000 years of history. They've shaken the heavens, they've overthrown the power of sin and its defiling effect on us. And as a result, the trajectory of our lives is reversed. We are no longer, if we look to Jesus, on a one-way journey towards more and more defilement and contamination. We're on a journey of sanctification, more and more cleansing through him as we keep returning to him. And Jesus will shake the heavens and the earth once more when he returns and is finally and ultimately revealed as God's Lord and King and Judge of everything. So look to Jesus when life and work and church is hard. Look to Jesus when you feel your own weakness and failure and defilement. Look to Jesus when you're let down by the imperfections of us around you even in church. Return to Jesus, who cleanses and blesses. Keep returning to him in repentance and faith. Look to him for the strength to do his work. Follow him.
Trust him. Be strong and keep working. Because he is with you and he will build his church. And it will be glorious. Why don't I pray? Heavenly Father, we pray to you, Jesus. What hope we have in the reminder that we are sinful and defiled and to ourselves. That we are weak and prone to get things wrong. Thank you that he is not that. That he is a leader we can look to and trust. To cleanse us, to bless us, to lead us back to you. And to complete all his glorious purposes in the church. Help us to trust you. Help us to make a habit of returning to him. And to enjoy your blessing. Amen. Amen.